afternoon, Cokesbury Church.
Well, welcome. Good morning. Hello. Happy Sunday. Uh, turn to those around you. Say good morning. You're glad to see them, and we'll keep uh, going in just a little bit. come before you today thankful that thankful that we can praise you God that we don't have to be fixed or perfect in order to worship you God I pray that you just 
God, that you would just take our worship and our praise this morning. God, and that you would, you would accept it as beautiful sounding, God, and sweet sounding to your ears, Father. God, we just lift you up this morning. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you guys. My name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here at Cokesbury. And if this is your first time with us, really glad that you guys are here. Bless you for showing up in the rain. Um, saw a lot of you guys trying to um, dry off when you came in. And I know you had a million places you could be today, but today is a, is a day that God has given us. And we're grateful that you guys have shown up. Also want to say good morning to everyone who's watching us online, wherever you're watching from. Always good to have folks with us from there. Um, we're going to dismiss our kids and if you have uh, never been through this before and you're wondering where your son or daughter's going, feel free to go with them. We've got K through four in the back and fifth and sixth graders. These guys are gonna go hear a message about Jesus and um, feel free anytime to go with them. We've got a dedicated group of folks who are gonna 
be with them and they're gonna have a blast. And when church is over, you can ask them what they, le- what they learned today and they're gonna be able to tell you. Um, that's the quality of leadership that we have in that ministry. And so uh, it's always good to see these guys line up in the back. Um, makes you feel good as a church that we've got an a, a environment where kids feel safe and where they feel loved. Um, as they're making their way out, a couple of quick things for you. Um, this week, um, another name's added to the list. Um, Tyree Nichols, and I know if you've watched the news, you're aware of what's going on, and if you had a chance to see the video, um, there are no words you can put to something like that. Um, inhumane would be an understatement. Um, horrific, I don't think, captures that moment. Um, it's just awful. And I get asked all the time when um, something like this happens, well, what can I do, right? Because that's sort of how we want to respond in that situation. And it's difficult, right? I mean, when you see something that is so um, counter to what we believe as people of faith and how we treat each other, um, it's hard to know what to do. And um, I always go back to, it's really not that hard. Um, Love God, love people, share hope. And um, that's the job of the church, is to speak out against injustice and make no mistake about it, it's horrific. But the truth is, on this side of heaven, justice cannot be served fully because his life cannot be restored. But what we can do is be aware and to speak out, and we can keep doing what God has asked us to do. And and I think that that is the purpose of the church. And so um, there's no easy way to transition out of something like that. But um, the way that we love God and love people and share hope is, is we try to direct our efforts not just at our community of faith, but we really wanna try to make Knoxville the best community that it can possibly be. And um, as people of faith, that can't happen without the presence of Jesus, that it is Jesus that makes a community the best it can possibly be. And so we've got an opportunity coming up tonight that is huge for us. Um, If you're a regular part of our church, you know this, we love school teachers, we've got a lot of school teachers in our church, um, all three of my sons are school teachers, and it just, you know, they're just unbelievable heroes in our community. And so from time to time, we try to figure out, well, how can we honor teachers? Well, tonight we've got an event at 5 p.m. So if you work with students of any age or you have someone in your neighborhood or in your circle of influence that works with kids, it, we wanna invite you to come tonight at five. Um, we've got a, a group coming, um, tonight that's the Color Works group. They were here before. They talk about um, understanding personalities, and so this is driven toward understanding personalities in your classroom. It's really just a time for us to say thanks to teachers. There'll be some um, treats for them to take. We've got some prizes we're going to give away, and then this group is going to come and offer um, sort of a, a continuing education opportunity for teachers. And so what I need you guys to do is, one, if you're a teacher, show up tonight. It's going to be awesome. If you know somebody, you can go right out to guest services and take one of these flyers with you and and drop it at their house and invite them to come tonight. Um, And then you can continue to join us in praying for our schools. Um, So much of of the future of our community is dependent upon what happens in the local classroom that we think it's important to continue to do that. So I hope that you guys will take advantage of that. And then another opportunity that's coming up fairly quickly is... um, is a next step for some of us. Uh, we believe in next steps that everybody has one of those to take. As long as you and I are drawing air into our lungs, we have a next step we can take. And some of those next steps come out of pain. And so um, we're gonna be offering divorce recovery in the next couple of weeks. You can go to cokesbury.tv, find out more information about that. It, it's offered through our recovery ministry, so you can also go to their website. All the information you need is, is there for you. This is a great chance to be with other people who are walking the same path but also to learn the tools of how do, I, how do I put my life back together again and how do I continue to move forward to become the person that God needs me to be. And so this is a great ministry opportunity. Um, if you have family or friends who have gone through a divorce, um, please point them to that. We would love to help and we would love to share hope with them through divorce recovery. So I hope that you guys will also take advantage of that. We're gonna receive an offering today And um, let me just say thanks to you guys. Um, I've never been around a more generous bunch than the people of Cokesbury Church. Um, The way that you guys so freely give of your time and resources to try to make a difference in the world, it is um, not just impressive, it is inspiring. 
And um, you guys do such a great job of that. Uh, everything that we take in, we try to turn right around and send it out into our community. Not that it um, maybe will make an impact, but we actually believe that God will use our resources week in and week out to impact specific people's lives so that they'll understand the love of God in their life and that it will change the trajectory of our community. And so there are a lot of ways you guys can give. You can give through our app. I know a ton of you guys give online. We're gonna go old school. I got some friends here on this campus who are gonna come and we're gonna receive an offering. But I hope you'll be generous. And um, as we take up this morning's offering, I'd like to ask you if you would to join me in just a moment of prayer. Gracious God, um, days like today are um, a blessing to be able to gather together as your people, but they're also difficult when we experience something as a community and as a state and as a nation where there are few simple answers. And God, we feel the heartbreak and the disappointment and the fear and the, the anger and the outrage. And Lord, it would be so easy if we could just snap our fingers and make everything right, but that's just not the world in which we live. And so God, I'm grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit that as we gather here on this campus or as we huddle up in our living rooms or on our treadmill or wherever we are today, I'm grateful that long before we made a decision to show up to Cokesbury Church, you were already here and your spirit was already working and you knew every person that was gonna show up and you knew every need that was gonna be brought into this room. And so God, I ask that as we receive this morning's offering that you'll do what you do best, that you'll take our gifts and that you'll multiply them and that you'll show us the right person who needs to benefit from those resources. Not that it will just help meet their immediate need, but God, that it will impact them deep in their soul and they'll understand that they are a son or daughter of the King and that their future is bright through you. God, I pray for Anna as she comes and she opens up God's word in just a few moments. Continue to give her the gift of your Holy Spirit. Step through her. Teach us your word so that by the time we're through, if nothing else happens today, all of us will have the assurance that we have stood on holy ground in your presence. For it's in the name of the resurrected Jesus that we pray. Amen.
morning. I'm Anna, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. I'm so glad that you all are here. And as pastors and as church leaders, we often you know, wanna put ourselves in a place where we are speaking truth um, and sharing truth from scripture and we are also trying not to take sides or be divisive, but then there's times when, you know, you just gotta say something and I'll just say, go 49ers. That's all I'm gonna say about it. <laughs> I know we have other, which someone pointed out to me earlier, they were like, you're wearing the Eagles colors, which I didn't think through that today, but um, of course my team, Titans, have been out, you know, that's not happening this weekend. So I'm gonna get to cheer for my son's team, which is the 49ers. So it's fun to get to do that. And we all kind of have our, I see the Chiefs are represented here. So we've got some different opinions, you know, and that is so true of life that we all are coming from our different perspectives. And we often can get really um, entrenched in our one perspective. We dig our heels in. And so much of our culture revolves around proving that we are on the right side or that we have the right opinion, or that we know everything there is to know. And so unfortunately, we get really into this idea of proving our own rightness, of proving to everybody else we know what we're talking about, we know what's going on. Um, Chris and I have been married for 18 years. That has given us many years of opportunity uh, for communication, cooperation, um, for compromise. And when you have been in a long relationship, whether it's with your kids or your parents or your spouse or somebody you work with, you know that any relationship is gonna have conflict. So it's not a surprise. So you, there are things you can do to prepare yourself to have conflict that is productive, right? That helps you solve a problem, that helps you be in conflict in a healthy way instead of a destructive way. We don't have to be afraid of it. Chris and I have had seasons where we have been not as good at conflict. We've not handled it as well. Then we've had other seasons and we hope we're in that growing um, where we know how to handle conflict and we can do it in a way that makes us stronger instead of tearing us apart. About six years ago, we were moving. And at the time, we had a four-year-old and a six-month-old, which is a great time to move if you've never done that. That's a great choice that we made. We also made the choice to do what we would call an in-town move. Has anybody ever done an in-town move? You think, that would be so easy. It's just right over there. What it actually means is, instead of just getting it over with all at once and just doing the move, we moved for weeks. It was like, let's take a hard thing and just make it last forever. So we, would, we already owned that home. It was a new house though, which is in many ways great. But you know, if you move into a house somebody else has lived in, there might already be towel bars and you know, light fixtures and all, all that kind of stuff, curtain rods. That, a lot of that stuff wasn't there. So our plan was that after work each day for a couple of weeks, I would get the kids, I would do dinner, bath, all of that. Chris would go straight to the new house and be knocking off these projects so that before we moved in, we would feel kind of ready, you know, things would be done. So that was the plan we'd been working. He'd been going over there night after night. I had been holding down the fort at home night after night. And we're just, you know, we're tired, we're moving constantly. It just, it felt like forever. There were, in this house, there were these beautiful windows, this set of three windows that looked out onto the trees. It was just one of my favorite parts of the house. And we decided we would hang curtains. I picked some out that I love, they're so beautiful. So it finally gets time, Chris is gonna hang the curtains. I think I, my memory is it maybe took him a couple of nights, cause it's just, you know, a ton of measuring, you're up on a ladder, you're by yourself, so it just takes a while. So he calls me, he's like, okay, I did it. The curtain, you're right, they look great. They're beautiful in this room. I want you to come over and see them. So I grab the four-year-old, I lit up the six-month-old, we go to the house, I walk into the room and I'm like, y'all, it looked awful. I, I, no disrespect, a lot of work went into that. It was awful. And I was having trouble controlling my face. I knew enough to not speak, but my face was just not doing what I wanted it to do. And he was like, what, what? And now he's already defensive. I haven't even said anything. And I was like, Look at it, it's awful. Y'all, the curtain rods were not straight. I'm like, we can't live here. Like, look at the curtains. And he's like, they are straight. I measured them three different times. They are straight, it is level. So we're having this argument in this empty living room of this house. Possibly we weren't both at our best point to be having this conflict, right? Like we're tired, we're dealing with all this stuff. Chris says, they're level and I'll prove it. And I'm like, get the level, let's go. Cause I know I'm right. He is certain that he is right. He gets out the level, he puts it on the curtain rod, darn if it wasn't level, that bubble. And I'm like, we have a trick level? Like, this, I, I have eyes, like I can see. 
they're 100% level. And so I'm like, okay, not one to be deterred by evidence. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care what your level says. I'm looking at it and it's not straight. Upon further investigation, we learned it was the crown molding above that was not level. Not to a point that it's like structurally, nothing was wrong. It just, you know, whoever installed that crown molding, it just wasn't exactly right, which means when you put something perfectly level next to something that's not quite level, the bottom thing looked incorrect. The, the, your brain thinks that the thing at the ceiling, that's correct, and, and it looked crooked. What happened in that moment was we both dug in our heels, and interestingly, we were both right. We were both correct. Chris was correct, he had measured correctly, he had used the tools. The curtain rods were level. I was also correct that it didn't look good. That maybe technically it was correct, but it didn't look right. That situation is an illustration for us in our lives of how useless it is to dig in your heels when you know you're right. It didn't matter that we were both right. That was not gonna solve our problem in that moment. And as humans, we are so prone to seeing things from our perspective. In fact, we are all limited by our own perspectives. We see what we see. We look at something only through our own lens. That's the only way we can. We're, we are ourselves. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of diligence to try to see something from someone else's perspective. In fact, if I asked for volunteers and I brought five of you up here and blindfolded you and brought out an elephant, which don't get excited, we don't have an elephant, <laughs> But if I did that, blindfolded four or five of you, brought an elephant out, and one of you I had touched the tail, somebody else I have touched the trunk, somebody else touches the tusks, somebody else pats the side of the elephant, and the last person maybe feels the leg of the elephant. And then I said, describe the animal in front of you. Totally five different answers. Every single person would be correct. They're experiencing it from their angle from the limited perspective that they have. So that's why it's so unhelpful for us to live in this culture of rightness, of saying, well, I gotta prove my point. I just gotta make sure everybody knows that I'm right. You might be, but approaching things that way doesn't get us anywhere. As a people, we struggle with humility. It is hard to say, I do not know everything. Practice it with me. I do not know everything. Some of you didn't say it because you're like, I'm not gonna lie in church, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> it is hard to admit, I do not know everything. That is a humble statement. We don't like it, we don't enjoy it. That curtain incident produced something in our family that we're still practicing all these years later. It's a phrase that goes like this, I could be wrong. We've tried to practice this phrase in situations when two people in our family get dug in about something. No, that's not how it happened. We did this, you know, and you've been in these conversations with your family. Somebody remembers it one way and you're like, no, I can, I can. What if we just say, as we've been practicing, you know what, I could be wrong. The way I remember that is, it, it just sets a little different tone. It's just a phrase that we're practicing to open up the idea that, you know, it's possible I don't know everything. And I'm gonna have the humility to admit that maybe I, I could be wrong, I think this is right. There's another phrase you can practice. Shauna Nequist is an author I love. She just wrote a book with this title. I just haven't learned that yet. You get into a situation where there's something you don't understand, or maybe your kid is explaining something to you about their generation or their perspective, and instead of shutting it down, or being like, that's crazy, I, I say, you know what, I haven't learned that yet. That, that's an okay way to approach somebody. Another phrase you can practice, tell me more about that. Instead of sh shutting somebody in your life down, immediately trying to go on the defensive or trying to put your own case out there or put your own evidence, you could say, tell me more about that. It's just a humble state, it just opens up the conversation. These are things we can do to set the tone of humility in our relationships. Now setting the tone is what this whole series that we're in is about. How do we set the tone for the year 2023? How do we set a kingdom tone? How do we set a tone for our lives as Christians? We're basing this series out of a scripture from Colossians chapter three. We've already been reading it, we'll touch base on it each week as we go through. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This passage holds a ton of characteristics of Jesus that we are going to try to emulate as his followers. We're going to try to set the tone for our year, set the tone for our life, set the tone for our church by looking through these characteristics. We've talked about compassion, we've talked about kindness, and you can go back and grab those messages online or on the podcast, but today, we're gonna talk about what it means to be humble. And sometimes we think, of our, we think of humility as like diminishing ourselves or putting ourselves down in some way. Sometimes that's like, that we think of it in terms of like humiliation, like being really um, put down in some way. And that's unfortunate because that's not what it means. It doesn't, being humble doesn't mean that you have to put yourself down. So we're gonna work through several different scriptures to sort of draw a circle around the word humility in terms of biblical text of ways that we can come at this and understand. We're gonna ask the question, why? Why do we need to be humble? We're gonna ask the question, who? Who is humble? And then we're gonna ask the question, how? Sort of an old school, like the scientific stuff you learn in school, like the why, the who, the how, just to get our head around this idea of humility. Because it's a word we kind of toss around but don't necessarily think a lot about. So first, why humility? It's in the list, of, so like, okay, we should do it. But why should we be humble? Why does it make a difference? The Greek word, if you translate it from humility, literally is talking about height. So it's actually saying like close to the ground, something that's brought down or close to the ground. If you're going the Latin word, the root of that word is ground or humility, um, earth. So it's this remembrance that we are from nothing. We're created people. We didn't create ourselves. God created us. So it's this realization of our own humanity, of our own mortality, it's realizing that we are not perfect. Earlier we said we don't know everything. That's the why of humility. And you can find it tons of places in scripture, but one of the most famous places is in Roman chapter three, which you may have heard before, but here's what verse 22 through 24 says. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The first step of becoming a Christian, which many of you have already done, you've already accepted Jesus as your savior, but the first step of becoming a Christian is actually a step of humility, which we don't always think about it that way, but the very first step of accepting Jesus is admitting that we need him in the first place. The beginning of our journey with Jesus is the admission that we're not all that, we're not the answer. The the answer to the question of why humility, it's well, because we're all sinners in need of God's grace. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need a savior. So our first step to follow him is to humbly admit that we need him, that I can't save myself. I can't do enough or be enough or say enough to ever earn the love of God. I, I already have it, I have this gift of grace and I'm just gonna accept that. So it's this life-changing moment where we take the step of humility to go, look, I'm a human person, (laughs) broken, sinful, in need of a savior. And it's life-changing. But it's interesting how quickly we can get off the exit ramp there. (laughs) If we can be on that path of like, I'm a sinner in need of grace. And then sometimes, over time, we start to begin to lift ourselves up a little bit. Like, I mean, we're, yeah, we're all sinners in need of God's grace. But then a bit, there's a southern phrase that if you're not from this area, I'm gonna teach you so you can use this in your day-to-day life. There's a phrase we use, some of y'all. Do you know this phrase? Um, Don't look it up in the dictionary because it's not there. But we might say, some of y'all need the grace of Jesus a little more than I do, right? Some of y'all are sinning even beyond the regular kind of sinning, right? We immediately, as we accept Jesus, wanna say, some of y'all are doing it worse than I'm doing it because we we wanna feel better about ourselves by putting down other people. And we don't have to do that. Because if we're honest, we all are sinners in need of God's grace. And if we find ourselves keeping track of the sins of the people around us, we can better believe we're not attending to the things that God's asking us to take care of. Because, you know, if I go to God and like, did you hear what so-and-so did? I just have to believe God's gonna be like, did you hear what you did? (laughs) Like, forget about that, that's above your pay grade. You need to focus on what you need to focus on. Stay in your lane which is that of humbly accepting the gift of grace for yourself and realizing that everybody's in need of grace. This is not a new problem, this is a very human problem. I wanna read you a snippet of a conversation Jesus had with some of the disciples in Mark chapter 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, 
We want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered, they're very confident. <laughs> Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10, the rest of the disciples, heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but it's not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. I love the initiative of James and John. You're like, what's the thought process there to go like, you know what we should do? We should go ahead and lock in our position for heaven. It's like they're calling shotgun in eternity. And Jesus is like, there is no shotgun. That is not how this works. But they're like, no, no, no. Yeah, well, I, I know we're all gonna get to be there in heaven with you, but we wanna be like in the best place, right? So even the disciples are struggling with this concept that we all have an even playing field when it comes to the grace and the love and the acceptance of God. They're having to relearn because Jesus says, you know, in the world, the rulers lord it over people when they're in charge. That's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, if you're a leader, you put yourself last and you serve people. It's this unlearning something we've already learned. I don't know if you've ever gotten the privilege of watching really little kids play soccer. It's so much fun because they play bunch ball and they all just, you know, go around with the ball. You can find the ball because you'll find, you know, six kids around it. But what we found is that when our oldest played his first soccer game, the most polite group of kids you've ever seen, the ball would come over here and they'd be like, oh, after you, you take a turn. Like they're getting out of the, like sharing the soccer ball because we have spent years teaching our kids to share and they're doing it. We should have been proud. Instead, we were all like, get it, take it, it's your ball. And these kids are like, what, what, who are you? They're having to unlearn something and learn a whole new way of being. That's often what we have to do as Christians. The world, our culture, has brought us up to say, look out for you, right? Have you ever been on LinkedIn? You ever seen anybody's profile there like, I am the best, let me tell you about it, <laughs> right? Like, this is what the world is often asking of us. Promote yourself, be, be an advocate, all these things, which are not always bad, but if that's the water that we're swimming in, we have to unlearn it sometimes to be able to understand what Jesus is asking us. So we go, okay, we understand why we need to be humble, but who is humble? Where can we look to this? Well, of course, Jesus is our example here. One of, I think, the most beautiful passages of the scripture, there are many, but it's found in Philippians chapter two, and it's a description of Jesus. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This passage is calling us to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. See, James and John, they're arguing about who's gonna be the best, who gets the best seat. And, and as you follow Jesus, you go, no, the mindset of Jesus is that even Jesus himself didn't come to be served, but to serve. Jesus showed us the model for, for who is a humble person. It's a servant leader. This concept of servant leadership 
come straight from the pages of the Bible, come straight from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus showed us a model of what it looks like to serve and lead, even when you could lord it over everybody else. Even when as a boss or a parent or the captain of the team or whatever position of authority you find yourself in, when you could say, well, I call rank and I'm just gonna tell everybody what to do and everybody listen to me. Instead, Jesus says, no, the real leadership that changes the world is when you come as a servant leader to others. It's the boss that shows up first and leaves last. It's the team captain who notices when somebody's having a hard time and goes to them and says, hey, how, what's going on? How can I encourage you? It's, it's the parent or the leader who says, you know what? I can take out the trash just like everybody else can. I'm not above that. It's this idea that we serve others and that is a type of leadership. The world often tells us that being a leader is being the one that gets to sit back in the big chair and watch while everybody else does the hard work. No, Jesus says a servant leader is a person who leads by example, who gets out there and shows us what it looks like. Jesus is our model. We see a glimpse of this in John chapter 13. I'm just gonna read you a snippet of a, a much larger story. It says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, Jesus had just washed the disciples' feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant's greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus takes on the role of a servant. That task of washing feet, especially back then, was not a pleasant one. That's something that, you know, their feet would be muddy from wearing sandals and walking all over, caked in heaven knows what from the road. That's a task a servant would have taken on, someone lowly. Jesus puts the towel around his waist and says, no, let me wash your feet. And then he's saying, this is how you lead. You, you lead by treating others the way you wanna be treated. The, you put yourself last. You, you lead with love. You lead with service and sacrifice. So we know why we need to be humble. It's because we're all sinners in need of grace. And we know who our model is. It's Jesus, this model of a servant leader. But then how? Right, like, I mean, I don't know about you, I don't get in a ton of situations that I'm washing people's physical feet. I mean, I have done that, but it doesn't come up day to day. So how is it that we practice this humility in our life? Well, I wanna share a scripture with you out of John chapter three. It's about a guy named John the Baptist. We studied a little bit about John the Baptist. He came up in the Christmas story a few weeks ago that his birth was foretold just before Jesus. He was born just before Jesus, and he had a specific mission to fulfill. John the Baptist's mission was to come and preach and teach repentance and prepare the way for the message of Jesus. So here's what's happening now. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where Jesus spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, Jesus, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everybody's going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends to the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it's now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John has been doing this incredibly important work. John the Baptist, he's out there. He's preparing the way for Jesus. And his disciples now are seeing Jesus coming into his own ministry. And the disciples are like, you won't believe that guy over there. Everybody's going to his line, not ours. And John's like, no, 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 that's the whole point. I'm here to make Jesus famous. That's my purpose in life. That's what humility actually looks like. That's the how. When we think about a life of humility, our starting point is that God must become greater and I must become less that if I'm gonna follow along after Jesus, my whole life is gonna be about making the name of Jesus more and more famous through my words, through my actions, through my service, through my gifts, through every part of my life, I wanna make the name of Jesus famous. Instead of caring about myself all the time, I wanna care about what God cares about. Now, this is not um, an invitation to be a martyr or to put yourself down or to ignore your own needs, not at all. Because if we're gonna care about what God cares about, I'm one of the things God cares about. There's 
famous passage in scripture, love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's important that we keep our own importance in mind, right? That I am God's chosen child, loved, deserving of God's love and grace because I was created and called by God. I'm deserving of it because of Jesus, but so is everybody else. There's a quote from, that's attributed to C.S. Lewis. It says, humility is not thinking less about yourself, but thinking about yourself less, right? It's caring about the things that God cares about, thinking less about me and more about we. And that's how we grow the kingdom of God. We want to focus our attention on a healthy and thriving group of people in our city. Instead of fighting for a bigger piece of the pie, we make a bigger pie. We're including more and more people, calling more and more people into the grace and love of Jesus. Now, if you're at Cokesbury any time other than today, we have, maybe we've even said it already today, but every week you will hear us talk about two words. You might know what they are. Next, steps. We talk about it every week because we really believe that the longer we live, the more and more next steps we have to take, that we never are finished. But what I don't know if we've ever said out loud is that the root of next steps is actually humility. Because the basis of this commitment to next steps is that we're admitting that we're not already like Jesus fully, right? If you're exactly like Jesus, do you have a next step to take? No. You don't have anything else to learn. I'm already, I'm already done. You know, if anybody wants to raise their hand and be like, I have completed the path. I would like to get my certificate now. The point of us talking about next steps all the time is that that is a way to live a life of humility, to say, God is not finished with me yet. Praise God that this is not a finished project. It takes humility to say, you know what? I need to start a journey of recovery. That's an admission that I'm not perfect. It takes humility to say, you know what? I'm in more pain maybe than I've let on, and I'm gonna start the next step of divorce recovery. Or my finances are really not where I want them to be. It takes humility to reach out and ask for help. It takes humility to take the next step to say, I really wanna know about the Bible, but I just don't know that much about it. That's the way that we become more like Jesus. We are humble enough to admit that we don't know it all. We might say, you know what, I'm just gonna be honest that most of the relationships in my life are kind of on the surface. I really want to get to know people deeper. That is an admission of our own imperfection, of saying that I'm not there yet, I'm not all the way to the goal that I wanna be at, I'm a work in progress. Jesus is still working on me, it takes humility to take a next step, because it's an admission that we're a work in progress, it's an admission that we are sinners in need of grace, in need of a savior, and then we start to follow Jesus. He's our model of humility and servant leadership, and we spend our whole lives taking next steps because a humble person is a growing person. If you know somebody that thinks they are all that and they've got it figured out, that is a person who is not growing anymore. Somebody who says they've got it all figured out. And maybe they're an expert in their field or they have been doing something a really long time, but if that person thinks that they are the smartest person in the room, they will stop growing. Because a humble person, that's a growing person. A humble person in a marriage, that means that marriage is gonna keep growing. A humble person in a parent-child relationship, that means there's room for that relationship to grow. A humble person at work, at school, on a team, in a friendship, there's growth opportunity there. But when you dig your heels in and you think you're exactly right and you think you know it all and you're God's gift to everybody else and everybody should listen to you, you have stopped growing. And that's a sad thing because we're given this one life and we get this opportunity to keep going. Brene Brown says it this way. She says, I'm here to get it right, not to be right. It's a little distinction there. We get caught up in wanting to be right. What if we stopped caring about that? What if we said, I wanna get it right, and if that means eating a slice of humble pie and admitting that I was wrong, that's worth it. I don't mind, I'll do that. Because it's so much more important to get it right. So that's my question to you today, is what is your next step? That's a step forward in humility that we can all take. Where in your life do you need to just have the admission that maybe you don't have it all figured out, or there's still something for you to learn, or there's still a way that you want to grow and, and access something new? If we are believers in the power of the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit, that means that we believe we can always change. God's never done with us. It's never too late. 
It's never too late for the grace of God to change your situation or your heart or your circumstance. But it takes the courage of humility to walk out and take a next step. So that's my invitation to you today. You can come up here and pray up front during the last song or you can pray where you are if you're at home and listening to this. The humble prayer of saying, God, I am not in control. I want to become less so that you can become more. I'm yours and I wanna serve you and I wanna learn. I'm listening, I wanna grow. That kind of humility will change our life and our church and our town. It will make this world a place where we continue to grow the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. God, we are here today in the midst of tragedy in our own country, war and violence around the world. But God, we just come to you today and humbly say, we do not know it all. We don't have all the answers, but we follow the God who does. God, help us to remember our own worth and value, but also help us to remember the worth and value of every single human on this earth. Help us, God, to make a difference and not make a point. Let us be agents for peace in this world. Let it start with each and every one of us. I invite you now to come in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. one more time this morning. We love you guys. We'll see you next weekend. Bring somebody back here with you. Try to stay safe and dry and warm. We'll see you next time.